What's going on YouTube, it's Teej, back again with another video. And today we're finishing off a two-part series talking about the top five players at each position group in the NFL. Offensive video is already up on the channel. Today we're talking about the five defensive position groups, starting with edge, then off-ball linebackers, IDL line, uh, safeties, and cornerbacks. So let me hear your top fives down below. My list is far from being the right list, but it's just how I see the league. I wanna hear your list and your rankings and your rationale down below in the comments section. Hopefully you guys enjoy. Be sure to hit that like button if you do. Subscribe if you're new to the channel and wanna see more football content. And let's waste no more time and let's jump right into it. So for edges, I mean, this probably was the hardest one for me to come down to, you know, maybe not a one through five, but who's one. Because I think there's a legit argument for any of the guys on this list. Uh, maybe with the exception of Max Crosby, but he's not terribly far off either. He just, we'll kind of go five up to one so we can talk about Crosby. He's just the only guy on that defense, really. And he's been the only guy on that defensive line. And it's it's very reminiscent to what Miles Garrett had to do and deal with up until this year. But he's just got no help. But dude, he continues to put up numbers. Such a strong player. The motor's off the charts. Um, and, and the production's followed suit. So yeah, Max Crosby had to be somewhere in the top five. Honorable mention to Joey Bosa. Bosa to me is probably a little bit more talented, but Crosby's on the field more, so I had to take that into account. Um, Micah Parsons, TJ Watt, Nick Bosa, Miles Garrett. Legitimately, I think there's an argument for any of these four. Um, if you're going to say Micah Parsons is number one, it's because, hey, he's such a twitchy athlete and he's so explosive that when he needs a big play, he's a guy who can generate it like that. Um, it comes almost on by his will uh, and it's insane and he's really refined his hand placement I'm really glad to see that Dallas has basically moved him to a full-time edge rusher because there's just more value in that versus splitting him in his time there and off ball so uh yeah just an absolute twitch up athlete great attack on the outside shoulder his hands have gotten so much better so he's out of that inside counter uh, and also pretty solid against the run you can see those instincts as an off ball linebacker cover come into play there uh TJ Watt you know, solid against the run, but where kind of maybe the difference was, uh, he gets his hands on more footballs. Like he's just got more career pass deflections and not even like over the course of the entire career. If you just look at the time Parsons been in the league versus Watt, Watt's missed time and still has more pass deflections. So he's just got that, you know, just like his brother, got a knack for putting those hands up, deflecting passes. He's also got a couple of ridiculous interceptions off tape that are basically all athleticism driven. Um, and then there might not be a player in the league that's a non-quarterback with a more stark on off winning percentage for their team so i think that big that plays a huge part in why i rank tj watt where he is and when he's on the field he, he is just a game wrecker um and he's kind of one of those guys where you look at the the like amount of pressures and then the conversion of sacks and he may not have the same pressure total as some of the other guys but he is such a great finisher that you got to forgive it because yeah typically you want to see high pressure numbers and then uh, you know, a solid amount of that converted to sacks. You know, Watt may not have those pressures, but he does get the sacks. And you may say, mm, that's not necessarily always repeatable, but he's done it for the last, you know, three to three to four years now. So for him, he seems to be the exception of the rule. And yeah, man, he is just an absolute stud. And again, the knack that he kind of has from his brother, getting his hands up, batting down passes, coming with interceptions was kind of why I nudged him over Parsons. And then we get Nick Bosa, who is... A great straightforward straight line athlete with ton of power, refined move set. The hands are fantastic. Plenty of first step juice. Um, good against the run. Uh, you could easily made the case that he is the number one edge rusher. But the reason I went with Miles Garrett, um, I think this is gonna be the year. This is kind of the breaks on the scene. Like his top 100 positioning was like in the 20s or something like that, which is just criminal. Um, and look, any given year, any one of these guys could have been Defensive Player of the Year. I think this is going to be the year where we see Garrett kind of put together that deep boy season. Now that Brown's defensive line actually has some talent on it, so he's not going to solely see double teams. He'll still see a lot of them, but now since there's reinforcements across that defensive line, teams will have to think twice about it um, and maybe allocate resources to let on those other players and maybe free up Miles Garrett that much more uh, or just have to play him honest. So I do think this is going to be the year where Garrett maybe just barely edges out someone like a Nick Bosa, but seriously, there is a very, very fine line between all these guys in any given year you could predict one of these guys the best edge rusher and that's what makes you know these types of videos hard i'm kind of projecting who i think the best five players at these respective position groups are going to be next year and i'm just going to say it's miles garrett this year um but like i said it could easily be any one of these five guys on the interior defensive line and you could make an argument aaron donald will kind of lose this number one seating but i am going to lean back into what we've seen in the years past um and to me, he's he's the best defensive player in my lifetime that I've gotten to see. Um, to me, he's the best defensive player since LT, uh, Lawrence Taylor, that is. So that, that kind of speaks to how insane uh, that I think he is. And I still think he's that caliber of a player. His problem is going to be, look at the Rams defense. And it's a bad unit with him on the field. And with him off the field, 
it's easily the worst defense in the league. Easily. And that's a problem. Um, so what type of help does he get from the rest of the crew? I don't know, but he's great against the run, the hands, the burst off the line of scrimmage, the full, if you've watched football the last decade, you know how much of a game record Aaron Donald is. I don't need to go through the scouting report. He's a freak and he's a three-time defensive player of the year winner and a Super Bowl winner for good reason. And yeah, to me right now, he's still IDL one, but this could be the year where Chris Jones surpasses him. And we're starting to see that that conversation become more and more, uh, had, uh, between NFL circles. So the fact that Chris Jones has even made it a conversation where up until this offseason, there really hasn't been a question about who's IDL one. That says a lot about how much Chris Jones has really been able to find another gear. Um, I do think the Chiefs, when they moved him full-time to edge, that was a bad decision because he is more valuable on the inside. But occasionally taking advantage of a bad matchup where it's like, hey, this team's tackle can't stand a chance against someone like a Chris Jones in a pass rush, need to win it situation. They leverage that. So, you know, it, it's kind of one of those things where they may have lost the battle, but kind of ultimately won the war. Um, and that versatility, that flexibility, plus what he can do as a pass rusher from the inside, had to be number two on this list. But it was tough because, uh, I mean, one of my favorite players and one of the players I think is the most underrated in the league, uh, Christian Wilkins, I would argue he's a top three to five most underrated player in the league. Um it was hard for me to not have him on this list because of how much I like him. But Cam Hayward comes in at three. He's a guy that just has aged like fine wine, gotten better and better and more and more productive past age 30, which defies all logic. Stout against the run, can play nose tackle, can play DN. So that flexibility across the inside is really, really nice. Um, and he's just steady, consistent, always on the field, churns out double-digit sack seasons, causes a lot of pressures and hurries from the inside. Uh, and yeah, you, you know, we're going to get to the point where it's like Cam Hayward, when's he going to hit that wall? But right now, there's no signs of him slowing down. He has just been fantastic each of the last three to four years. Really, since turning age 30, he went from a pretty good IDL player to a top five perennial IDL player in the NFL. Then I got Dexter Lawrence and Quinn and Williams. So a couple of young guys. Again, you could have thrown Christian Wilkins on here. And uh, in retrospect, Jeffrey Simmons is, is someone that should have had should have been on here. But we'll use that as the Jeffrey Simmons motivation tour. I'm, I'm sure he's totally watching this video. Um, in, in hindsight, Williams would probably come in at three. And because of that... We're gonna make a quick edit here. If you learn nothing else from today's video, just know that you've learned it's never too late to make a mistake uh, or admit that you made a mistake. Jeffrey Simmons should easily be number three here. I love me some Cam Hayward, don't get me wrong, but Jeffrey Simmons is a better player, insane against the run. And you're seeing a lot of these GMs, like you look at the ESPN interviews and some other you know media outlets who have done interviews about who could be that next you know Aaron Donald type of presence. And a lot of them are pointing to Jeffrey Simmons and uh, you know a, a late round flyer for Tennessee late in the first round because of the injury right before the draft, but has paid off big time. And has really emerged as a really, really nice pass rushing force for a team that needs it because they don't have like a dude on the edge. So they need that Jeffrey Simmons presence on the inside and one of the best run defenders as well. Um, came here where we already talked about. So sorry, Quinn Williams, you're going to be taking off the list. Uh, breakout season last year. And if he doubles down on that, I could easily see a world where Lawrence moves up to four, or Williams becomes number four and Cam Hayward potentially falls off this list. And who knows, like, wouldn't shock me if Aaron Donald retires after some coming season. Depends on where the Rams end up going after this year. But anyways, getting back on track here. Dexter Lawrence then comes in at five. A guy who, over the last two years, has really emerged as one of the best interior defensive linemen. Um, Sexy Dexy, I mean, is the reason why Kirk Cousins throws it short on fourth and eight. He just obliterated the inside of Minnesota's interior offensive line. Made Kirk Cousins uncomfortable. Forced him to get the ball out quick. Hawkins a good break of tackle. Like, that's the type of impact that these top-end IDL players can have. Especially in an advantageous matchup like a bad against a bad Minnesota interior offensive line. So, yeah, Lawrence is another one of those guys that's taken a huge step forward, really grown as a pass rusher, always been a pretty good run defender, was that at Clemson, and now we've kind of seen, kind of like his career at Clemson, took a little bit for the pass rush and that production to kind of come suit. The same thing's happened at the NFL level, but man, if you're a Giants fan, it's been worth the wait. On off ball linebackers, I got Fred Warner at one. Um, a lot of guys here I like, and um, two and three, I'm kind of just projecting those, these guys uh, to be a little bit better than Levante David and Demario Davis, who were probably better last year, especially considering Leonard didn't play. But uh, I think Fred Warner's just got him all beat. Um, you know, he he is, I don't want to say he's the reason we're seeing linebacking position change so much uh, and be the smaller, more athletic, zone coverage-based type of specialists as opposed to, you know, six foot five, two 245 linebackers of old. Uh, but his success and the fact that he, to me, is the number one off-ball linebacker in the league Definitely doesn't slow down that movement, right? Uh, but just a freak in coverage, insane change of direction skills, and he's been the heartbeat of the middle of that 49ers defense for half a decade plus now. Uh, and then I got Roquan Smith at two. Once he got to Baltimore, he clicked. Like, uh, it was the perfect place for him to go. Um, and we saw some of the highs in Chicago, and those high points in Chicago was top three offense, off-ball linebacker in the NFL. 
And I think he's going to have that same high this upcoming year in Baltimore. Uh, and hopefully that in turn makes Patrick Queen that much better or it just, you know, lets Trenton Simpson be a better version of Patrick Queen. So a really interesting situation. When you see that force multiplying effect, it's, it's hard to deny. And that's why I had to have Roquan Smith here at number two. Um, then we get to Shaq Leonard. So obviously coming off an injury, but when the dude's healthy, he's a stout run defender who just has an insane nose for the football. This guy makes plays left, right, and center. He's a turnover machine. And then when you talk about, yeah, he's a little small, but he's a twitched up athlete. How's he going to fare against the run? He's more than fine. He's more than serviceable for that matter against the run. So I'm assuming that he is going to get a clean bill of health, play a full 17 games. And if he is... To me, no doubt he's a top three off-ball linebacker in the NFL. And, you know, Smith, Leonard, I got these young guys just edging out Levante David, Demario Davis. Part of it is, you know, I'm starting to wonder when the wall's going to hit. Uh, Levante David's still as sure and as steady as it gets. Such a technically sound player. And where they kind of let Devin White be kind of a loose cannon, Levante David is that stable presence. And he's so good in coverage. And, you know, he was the guy that had Travis Kelsey as his main assignment in the Super Bowl a handful of years ago or three years ago, I guess now. Um and such a great run defender. Again, the instincts are there. Um, he's just still one of the game's best. But now we're getting to the point where it's like, hey, age is going to eventually catch up. And you saw the PFF grade slip a little bit from like elite to still very high end, just not necessarily elite last year. And I think age and maybe losing the step is, is part of that. And then Demario Davis, I mean, another guy that ages like fine wine. It, it makes no sense why Demario Davis year over year seemingly gets better at football. It, it blows my mind. But that being said, another guy where it's like, okay, when is the age going to catch up to him? But until it does, very instinctual, fills run lanes, fantastic tackler, good enough athlete to hold up in coverage. I don't think that's necessarily his strength, but he kind of makes up with it, makes up for it with football IQ and know-how. So um, yeah, really all five of these guys are really special players. And hey, when you're doing a top five players to each position, you know, uh, position group, you're going to have a lot of special athletes. Not like there's going to be a, a glaring weakness. Maybe outside of the offensive line, there's a couple guys there where it's like, I don't know if they're great, but they're good. They're just maybe not great. Here on the defensive side, we don't have that issue. And of course, that includes cornerback. Um, and, and I might rub some people the wrong way having Jalen Ramsey at one. I know last year wasn't the, like the best year of his PFF grades or whatever, but the Rams just kind of had an abysmal season. Uh, they couldn't generate any pass rush, which leaves him out to dry. He was kind of playing some linebacker almost. Um, and they've always kind of toyed with the idea of getting him closer and closer to the line of scrimmage. You know, uh, their Super Bowl run season, he started the year playing a lot in the slot because he's a great run defender and you want to tap into that. Um, but I think when push comes to shove and he comes back and he's healthy with Miami, assuming they don't rush him back and he is fully at 100%, We'll see it because he's a fantastic scheme fit for that Vic Fangio defense. Um, but I, once you put him back in a competitive situation, I, I think you'll see that switch flip and we'll see top end Jalen Ramsey. And to me, his top end is still the best in the game from a coverage standpoint, but also tackling, hard hitting. And it's kind of like blocking for a wide receiver. It's not the main selling point, but if you can do it, I'm not I'm not going to ignore it. And that's kind of where I stand on Jalen Ramsey and his run defense. It's, it's not that necessarily... It's the the breaking point, but I think he's just again in top end situations and top end of his play. He's a lockdown corner, just like any of the other four guys on this list. But then you throw in the fact that he's a great run defender and he's a hard hitter, and you can blitz him from the slot. He can just do a little bit more than I think some of these other guys can do. Well, also again, I think his top end coverage stuff might be just a smidge better than a lot of the other guys on this list, which. It's hard to tell, but we'll see how kind of age and the injury hits him as well. Sauce Gardner, Pat Sertan, a couple of the young guys here. Uh, second year Gardner, third year Sat Sertan. I actually kind of want to start with Sertan here. I'm really interested to see how he goes from this, you know, quarters heavy defense the first two years in the league, including last year with Ajero Evero as the DC in Denver. So now Vance Joseph wants to play a lot more press man. That's a, I mean, it doesn't really get, I don't want to say much more stark because, you know, cover four can be a lot of man, but religiously playing, you know, off man, essentially in quarters versus that man press getting into the face of a wide receiver. That's a huge difference there. So I want to see how he handles that task. And hey, if he has another season like he did last year, but in a different style of defense and with a different physicality kind of in its nature, I can see where he flips Sauce Gardner at two. Um, but, you know, Sauce Gardner, the, the tough part here is we only got a one year sample size. So maybe it's the good side of variance. But man, he was special last year. Only allowed the one touchdown on a coverage bust. You know, I think it was, you know, him. But, you know, it's communication let down. So it's hard to kind of point it at one specific person. But other than that, man, he was truly a lockdown corner. Got his hands on enough footballs last year to where, you know, it was good enough. Checked enough boxes for me. Not that I think that's the end-all be-all because, you know, we go back to Namdi Asma. If a dude's not open, a, f a quarterback's just not going to throw it your way, especially when they can just pick on the other side. The good thing for the Jets is DJ Reed also had a fantastic year. So quarterbacks had to test Sauce Gardner, and more often than not, that was a decision they would come to regret. The length, the size, good enough straight line speed. 
if he backs up what he did last year, he's going to be living in this top three conversation for plenty of years to come. And then we get Jair Alexander at four. And I think top end play, kind of like Ramsey, uh, he might be at this point. Like if Ramsey's not the same guy post-injury, and you're asking me who's got the most talent of any of these guys, I might tell you Jair Alexander. Last year was a little bit of a down year, a couple of miscommunications and coverage busts early on in the season and that Joe Barry defense where they play a lot of quarters and communication's key. Um, but we also saw him rise to the occasion and not that he was necessarily shadowing Justin Jefferson in that second Packers-Vikings matchup, but he certainly saw a whole lot more one-on-one coverage than he did week one. Um, and he rose to the occasion. It was by far and away Justin Jefferson's quietest game. And then, of course, he hits the gritty on him. Like, I mean, it just, his, his, that dog in him is just something else, which I know that's like top tier, you know, big brain analysis right there. He's just got that dog in him. But he legitimately does. And I mean, he's got another, he's another one of these guys that has a knack for finding the football. It's just a turnover machine. Um, I, I think, um, I can't remember what, oh, it was the Bills game where, Allen's just trying to spike into the dirt. Really, he could have had a better better way of just killing the play. But ultimately, he's just trying to find the turf and get to the next down. And Jair Alexander sees what he's trying to do and reads it and comes flying in, diving interception. He's got that, you know, backyard type of instincts that separates him from your just normal good corner. So uh, I know last year was a little bit of a down year, but I think this is the year he gets back on track. And I think that kind of as a whole for Green Bay's defense. Then I got Darius Slay here at five. I still think he's one of the best corners of football. There's a, there's a lot of guys you could have considered here. Xavier Howard, just to name, you know, one more um, that I was kind of considering. But yeah, Darius Slay is just still, even in you know his 30s now, I mean, the guy is just still a top-end athlete, sticky in coverage, gets his hands on football, technically sound. A lot of those same stuff that we kind of saw and made him one of the best corners in football at in Detroit hasn't gone away yet. Uh, now, I know we're going to get to the point in age where it's like, okay, well, when does it happen? But I think he's worthy of the extension he got. Uh, and honestly, I think Philadelphia didn't get it at a terrible price point given how good he still is. Um, now, if you tell me in three years' time, he kind of hits a wall, I wouldn't be shocked. But for right now, he's still got to be in that top five conversation. Then we get to safeties. I think Derwin James, I mean, Mika might be a little bit more productive, maybe. You know, Derwin's obviously got a lot of the injury concerns in his past too. But I just think when you're talking talent, it's hard not to have Derwin out here because he could play outside corner. He could play slot corner, free, strong, like legitimate. He could play linebacker, I think, if you needed him to in the right scheme. The guy could do anything. He's just a freaky athlete with a legitimately well-rounded football skill set. Like, ask him to do something. Odds are he's pretty damn good at it. So I had to have him here at one. Mika Fitzpatrick, to me, is like an ideal free safety. Yes, he can do some stuff in the box. Not a terrible tackle, tackler, but he plays his best when he's got his eyes on the quarterback and trying to decide and read him to dictate where the football is going. And then quick break on the football, really solid hands, uh, good positioning, knows how to cut off that route, knows how to take that right angle. Like really the angle game is, is a kind of an underrated one you talk about when it comes to Mika Fitzpatrick. Um, but yeah, what, and he's NFL top 100, number one safety. You know, I just think Derwin has probably a little bit more talent in his body, can do a little bit more things, but that's not to say Mika's not a stud. And to me, probably the best free safety in the league, just barely over Kevin Byard. I think Fitzpatrick's maybe a little bit better of an athlete. Byard's also a little bit older, so, you know, it's kind of comparing apples and oranges, uh, but Bayard coming off another season where it's like, dude, this guy's a true over-the-top free safety. Has still got it, man. Um, and again, may not have the same like first step juice that Fitzpatrick has, the long speed that Mika has, or Derwin for that matter. But football IQ understands the offense. Like definitely a tape study warrior. Um, and also a really good tackler and really good against the run too. Like as much as I think of him as a playmaking over the top free safety, he's stout against the run. And that's a really well coached Titans defense. And, you know, I, I think Kevin Byard encapsulates a lot of what makes that Titans defense so, so good. Uh, or at least generally pretty good, especially against the run. And, you know, he's definitely one of the biggest strengths they have against the pass. And Don Winfield Jr., I know Tampa Bay was a little bit of a down team last year, but this dude is is special, man. He can play slot, strong, free safety, move all over the field, good against the run, can be used as a blitzer, good enough in coverage with some tough assignments, especially when he's playing in the slot. Um, yeah, I just think he's a really, really special football player. And hopefully we get to see the Bucks kind of bounce back or him go to a different team where we get to see him play in primetime games because that Bucks Super Bowl run, he was one of the things I most look forward to when the Bucks were on TV. Um, and then we get Justin Simmons here. Um, Another tough one because it's like, oh man, Micah Hyde's still a stud. Should I have him on here? Uh, love me some Javon Holland. Should I have him? Should I have him on here? Jesse Bates was hard not to include on this list, especially considering I think he's got the perfect defense for him in Atlanta. But I'm gonna go Justin Simmons. Um, I think that Vance Joseph defense is a good spot for him. Another guy who's really good as a strong safety playing in the box and is a good tackler. But when you just let him be play over the top free safety, he, he's 
there's not many in the game better than him. Um, just a really fluid athlete, big, tall guy, long arms. He does it just a little bit different than guys like an Antoine Winfield Jr. or maybe even a Minka Fitzpatrick because of that. But he's still so, so productive. You go back to two years ago when I think, you know, especially the first half of two years ago, you know, I think there was rightfully so some conversations where it's like, you know, is he safety one or is he in that top three conversation? And hopefully this is a bounce back here for Denver across the board and then for Jeffrey Simmons, who was solid last year, but hopefully he gets back in that that spot where it's like, yeah, this guy's comfortably a top five safety, maybe even should be even higher. But guys, that is going to do it for my top five position players at all five defensive position groups. Apologies for the change on the fly with interior defensive linemen, but again, it's never too late to admit you made a mistake. So let me hear your top five in each of these position groups down below in the comments section. Who's your top five? Edge, IDL, off-ball linebackers, corner, and safeties. I want to hear your list down below because my list is certainly not the right list. So let me hear your rationale for why yours is down below. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. Hit that like button if you did. Subscribe if you're new to the channel and want to see more football content like this. But that's going to do it for me. Hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. And until next time, my name is Teej, and I'm signing off.